I appreciate this opportunity to talk about misconduct in science, but I'm sure many of you are wondering why I'm even bothering to talk about it. Misconduct in science used to be the, the province strictly of the scientific community. Some scientists behave unethically, others would be highly critical of them, and the debate would go on. There would be a probium for those who presumably were violating ethical standards. But unfortunately, as time has gone on, the government has become involved. And when the government became involved, the scientific problem of uh, mis misconduct in science became much more complicated. And this outline is sh of my talk is shown here. Why government became involved, an inaccurate response, this will deal with some scientists, the years of debate, which went on for a long time, misperceptions of science and scientists which have confused the debate enormously, there was a battle between the scientists on the one hand and the lawyers on the other because they didn't, the lawyers didn't understand what science is all about. And finally, the outcome, a definition and a mandated course on responsible conduct of research, which is now called RCR. It all began with hearings before the United States Congress. Uh, at that time, the Science and Technology Committee was, uh, had, on its, had on it a young congressman by the name of Al Gore. This is the early 1980s. And there were scandals at Harvard and at Yale of absolutely unbelievable behavior on the part of leading scientists at those two universities. And Gore then conducted a bunch of hearings. And he was flabbergasted at the hearings because he heard about stories, for example, scientific papers that were written when the experiments were never performed. So there were a whole series of testimonies. And subsequent years, there were testimonies before other committees besides that which Gore was on. So, and one of the people who testified before Gore was, in fact, the president of the National Academy of Sciences. And this is from his testimony, or a summary of his testimony. He was then president of the National Academy. He indicated that him, quote, gave him little pleasure, pleasure and satisfaction to testify on the si subject of scientific fraud. The problem has been greatly exaggerated in the press. And, and, when, there, and when there is fraudulent science, and I'm quoting, it occurs in a system that operates in an effective democratic and self-correcting mode. This viewpoint was echoed by Donald Fredrickson, who at that time was director of NIH. Well, you can just imagine the reaction of the congressman. For example, Gore's comment was, I cannot avoid the conclusion that one reason for the persistence of this type of problem is the reluctance of people high in the scientific science field to take these matters very seriously. And this should have admitted there was fraud in science. There's, it's been exaggerated to be sure, and there is very little of it compared to the amount of science being done. But even that is way too much, and we need to do something to correct it, instead of taking the position that science is self-correcting. Science is only self-correcting when, when the work is very important. Lots of trivial work is published, and it never gets corrected because it's of relatively small significance. So the battle went on for quite a while. And immediately, the press picked this up. And there's an article from the Chicago Tribune a little later in the 1980s by John Crudson, who was a Pulitzer Prize winner, called Cheating in the Lab. Under pressure, some researchers break the law. That article is disgraceful. It has more mistakes in it than much of the science that he was criticizing. And those mistakes have never been remedied in subsequent publications. Breaking the law does not appear very much in that particular article. And then. The headlines, look at the headlines. Scientists under fire. Uh, global trend, more science, more fraud. Squalor in science. Cancer study was made up. Are researchers trustworthy? Investigators investigated. Fraud in science. How much, how serious? The science mob. Fraud, complacency, and secrecy. And then the last two I love. Publish or perish or fake it and did we rear a bunch of moral mutants? So this is the way the press reacted. And finally, books began to appear. So here's one written by William Broad and Nicholas Wade. Broad and Wade, at the time he wrote that book, were both correspondents uh, for science, the journal Science. They both now are prominent uh, reporters for the New York Times. The title of their book is Betrayers of the Truth, as if they know what truth is, Fraud and Deceit in the Halls of Science. And this is where I move into the idea of misperceptions, because the book is full of misperceptions. Here is the preface. And I called it Erroneous Perceptions of Science and Scientists. They wrote, according to the conventional wisdom, 
Science is a strictly logical process. Objectivity is the essence of the scientist's attitude to his work, and scientific claims are rigorously checked by spirit scrutiny and the replication of experiments. From this self-verifying system, error of all sorts is speedily and inexorably cast out. That's nonsense. It's full of incorrect statements. For example, much of science is not a logical process. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2011 was given to a scientist who made a chance discovery, followed it up by his intuition, his instincts, nothing logical about it. He just uh, didn't bow to the criticism of experts who said it was sheer and adulterated nonsense, and the work proved to be correct. So that's an indication that logic is not necessary ingredient of science. Chance, opportunity comes along. Scientific claims are checked in, by spirit mutiny. They're, they're not always checked, and, and they certainly are not eliminated by uh, self-verifying system and speedily and inexorably cast out. So Broad and Wade have, in fact, distorted the, the, the culture of science and the nature of scientists themselves. Scientists, many of them, are subjective, uh, uh, biased individuals, and it's only through the collective activity of scientists as a whole, the community of scientists, that we get objectivity. But we don't get objectivity from individual people necessarily. So let me go on now. Since I talked about truth, here is a statement that I came across very early in this discussion. Truth in science depends on the researcher's unbiased application of proven investigative techniques to appropriate experiments. Again, a statement that's riddled, riddled with mis misperceptions. What is truth? Will it be the same tomorrow as today? How do we know? Who decides? Who is unbiased? How do we recognize appropriate experiments? And who determines what technique is correct? Who knows what is proven? As years go by, we keep changing our mind about science, and that's the nature of the culture of science. So this, mis this misperceptions has led Congress down the wrong path because they began to develop procedures which de dealt with fraud. And they were talking about the word fraud, which I'll come back to in a little while. So what was the Washington solution? The Congress was having its meetings, so they first had convened committees. Then there were commissions created because the committees were inadequate. The committees came in with, the commissions came in with reports. Then they had to set up review committees, so there were reviews. Out of that came the Office of Scientific Integrity. I left out another office but, uh, called the Office of Scientific Integrity Review. But finally, they came to the Office of Research Integrity, which we have today. That office then hired staff. They have a big budget. They called meetings. They developed policies. Regulations resulted. They required courses. And now we have a shopping list of topics. So this is how responsible conduct and research arose on the university campuses, and students had the dubious pleasure, those who were supported by NIH or NSF, had the dubious pleasure of taking such courses. So now we go on to ask a very fundamental question. Up until now, the language had been fraud. And I posed the question, why was fraud replaced by misconduct, and what is misconduct in research? Two questions. I should point out that the scientific community was unified in being opposed to fraud. We thought we knew what fraud was, and we were very happy to say fraud is intolerable. NIH and NSF both should impose sanctions on scientists who are guilty of committing fraud. But all of a sudden, the word fraud disappeared, and we wound up with the word misconduct, and we begin to ask why. And then the scientific community became very exercised. So the answer to why the, it, it shows up on this slide. Here's a, a, an article, again, from the late 1980s, in Time Magazine called Science Under Siege. And you see the scientists sitting there on the stage of the microscope, and the words tight money, blunders and scandal plague American researchers. But interestingly enough, at the top of this cover of Time Magazine is the question, do we have too many lawyers? My friends think I put that in there with Photoshop, but the truth of the matter is, it was in a, a separate article in the journal, but it turns out to be very useful for my present purposes. Why are the, did I bring up the idea of lawyers? Lawyers didn't like the word fraud. Fraud in American jurisprudence requires enormous burden on the lawyers who are trying to prove fraud. For example, you have to show that there's a false representation. Defendant knew it was fault. There was intent to deceive and induce reliance. And then the final point, which is much more 
difficult for a lawyer to prove about a scientific paper, there was justifiable and actual reliance on the misrepresentation and actual damage. So many of the papers that would be considered fraudulent in scientific literature don't do much damage except to the individual who wrote the terrible paper, but they don't do damage to the community. So the lawyers did not want to have the burden of pursuing a case on the basis of fraud, and they therefore came up with this wonderful phrase, misconduct, and that's when I got very, very alarmed. Working scientists were terribly concerned about the idea of switching from fraud to misconduct in science or misconduct in research. We wanted a very tight, rigorous definition, not something open-ended which defied interpretation. To us, misconduct was very simple. It involved fabrication, making up data or results, falsification, changing data or results, and plagiarism, using as one's own the ideas or words of someone else. So there were three areas where scientific community came, was almost unanimous in terms of judging something to be misconduct for which sanctions would be appropriate. But the lawyers were not happy with that limited definition. They preferred something much more open-ended as shown here. So in addition to having the words fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, they wrote, and other practices that seriously deviate from those that are commonly accepted within the scientific community for proposing, conducting, or reporting research. What does that mean? Misrepresentation, deception, selection of data, inadequate referencing, malfeasance, misfeasance, et cetera, et cetera. They love vagueness and an open-ended law, and that's why there was a battle between the scientists on the one hand and the lawyers on the other. I recall vividly being in a meeting at NIH at the invitation of James Weingarten, who was then director of NIH, to discuss this battle over fraud versus misconduct. And in the room were the two of us representing science and about 20 lawyers. Many of them were about six or eight were from various government agencies, and the other 12 or so were from universities, chief counsels of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, California, et cetera, Stanford. And we had terrific battles over this particular issue. Should we say uh, fa FFP, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism, or should we have something much more open-ended, such as the uh, other practices that seriously deviate? And at the end of the day, we wound up very happy because it was, the decision was made that we would have only the three categories as misconduct in science. And I left very content only the next day to receive a phone call from Weingarten that the problem which had been resolved on the NIH campus with government participation had moved downtown to what is, as they say, downtown means the Department of Public Health. And that's where they had lawyers and no scientists, and they put back this clause and other practices which seriously deviate. So the battle for removing the seriously deviate clause went on for a long time. Fortunately, we got a break, and here is the break. There was a case involving a worker on an NSF grant, and the he was charged with misconduct in science. And here's the language. And the office, OIG stands for the Office of the Inspector General. OIG determined that the researcher had been involved in 16 incidents of sexual misfeasance with female graduates and undergraduate students at the research site, on the way to the site, in its home, car, and office. Many of these incidents were classified as sexual assaults. OIG further determined that these incidents were an integral part of this individual's performance as a researcher and research mentor and represented a serious deviation from accepted research practices. Therefore, according to NSF and the definition at the time, they amounted to research misconduct under NSF uh, regulations. And you can well imagine this created a major storm. I went around the country showing this in lots of places, I put it into an article published in Science, and it had, it had the reaction that you'd expect. It was preposterous. You can't have a definition. Incidentally, I read many of the affidavits of these 16 incidents. These were sexual abuses. They should have been prosecuted by state law, and, and there was no question about it. So as a consequence of this, we finally reached a stage where we got rid of the, that language. We wound up with FFP, fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. I remember easily because I use FFP stands for Frequent Flyer Program. I was flying back and forth across the country a great deal. So we wind up with a course. This gives you an indication of the extent of the course, and I'll, I'll just go through this very briefly. 
It starts at the top. This is my course, for example, research misconduct, and I deal with specific cases of fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Then we address the issue of whistleblowers. When you have suspected misconduct, or errors even, whistleblowers come in and we discuss the role and plight because they suffer enormously on frequent occasions. And finally, we get to uh, publication practices, authorship, citing previous work, access to data, sharing of data, retention, ownership of data, and collaborative research. Authorship practices don't belong in the province of the United States government. They are problems which have to be solved in a collegial fashion. They're very difficult at times, and there will be contentious points of view about this. But in any case, they are not what I call research misconduct and are not governed by the Office of Research Integrity. And then I get to peer review, scientific papers, grant applications, confidentiality, and mentor-mentee relationships. And then in big print at the very bottom is conflict of interest and commitment. Interestingly enough, that to me is the most important area of misconduct, and it's one that the Office of Research and Integrity never deals with. You know, as in most fields of endeavor, there are different points of view as to how to deal with the problem. For example, there are people who think that you can stamp down fraud. Here's an article, a very recent article from earlier this month. The time is right to confront misconduct. Current scientific leaders have the opportunity to take the initiative and stamp down fraud. And I maintain you can't stamp down fraud. I maintain that the people in ORI who are talking about preventing fraud are kidding themselves. Fraud is something that occurs for people who are usually sociopaths. You can't stop Wakefield in London. You can't stop Nemoff in the Berkeley Lawrence Laboratory from discovering an element that he didn't discover, or Schoen in Bell Labs from discovering all sorts of wonderful things that were not real. These things go on, and we can't stop them. And all you have to deal with is impose sanctions when the evidence is clear, and then try and straighten out the scientific literature. So for example, in trying to stamp down fraud, you come across this wonderful quote, which I got from a professor of criminal law at uh, Columbia University. He says, you can learn from criminal law experience. The issue is not whether we should countenance science fraud. Of course we should not, any more than we should countenance burglary. But a criminal law perspective teach, teaches that it is not worth the resources, both economic and ideological, to try to prevent all burglaries. The issue is how many burglaries are tolerable given the alternatives. By contrast, leading scientists discussing science fraud at time sound as though collective guilt is just justly imposed every time someone is caught stealing. And that's the fundamental problem. So he supports the view that you can't eliminate fraud. But what you could do is something about the second problem. For example, here is a, an article from the Chronicle of Higher Education of just a few days ago. It's called Academic Researchers Escape Scrutiny in Glaxo Fraud Settlement. Now, GlaxoSmithKline just settled a $3 billion lawsuit with the United States government over fraud over their drug Paxil. But the, the settlement involved not only the company, but it involved the statement that articles who were published by 22 professors at universities, written by a company that was hired by Glaxo, uh, were involved in this fraud as well. It, re it reads as follows. Federal prosecutors triumphantly announced the nation's largest ever healthcare fraud settlement last month when the pharmaceutical ma maker GlaxoSmithKline admitted marketing this, this drug for unapproved purposes. Virtually unpublished was a key detail. One of the central pieces of evidence in the case was a 2001 scientific article listing 22 authors, most of them university professors, researchers, that were actually, the article was actually written by Glaxo, hired authors, to overstate the benefits and understate the risks of a highly uh, uh, profitable uh, Glaxo drug. And when the settlement came out, they called the article as being part of the fraud perpetrated by the company. But nothing was done about the professors. In one case, I know of a university professor writing a note an allegation about one of his colleagues at that university, the president says nothing can be done about it. And nothing has been done about these 22 who are very prominent individuals. So I close with asking, are we getting anywhere on teaching these courses? And I think you ought to continue teaching them. I enjoy the participation in the class, and I try and turn the students on about the problem. And I might point out that 
scientists are human beings. And there's a wonderful commentary on science which comes from a New York Times article of 1885. Times have really not changed. It reads as follows. Like other men, uh, please pardon them for being sexist because women weren't doing much in science in 1885. So like other men and women, they are self-seeking, uh, ambitious, and have per both personal, their personal ends to gain. Can we assume that morally they are any better than their neighbors, or that if they get uh, possession of place and pro power, they will not use and pervert them to the pr pr promotion of their selfish objects? It is to be hoped, please, it is to be hoped that in the future, remember this is 1885, science will become so developed as to react upon character and give us men, and I'll add women, morally as well as intellectually superior, but we are far from any such happy results as yet. So we're still hoping. And I will continue to teach, but I want, want to point out that it's, it's, not, it's difficult to know whether one is being successful and having any influence in the course. And I have a wonderful cartoon, which was written by a man by the name of Himmelblau, who was a student at the University of Wisconsin and then became a postdoc. And he wrote at the bottom, looking at the seminar board, about all the seminar notices on ethics. I have to fake my data. With all those ethics seminars, I don't have time to do experiments. Thank you very much.